It is fantastic to be here with you. Uh, I was a little intimidated by being asked to speak first, but I think it's uh, an opportunity to hopefully get everyone awake and thinking big this morning. Um, and the, the title of the talk is, Are We Thinking Big Enough for What's Ahead? But I want to start by talking about something very small, which is the town that I'm from. Lexington, Tennessee, population 7,667 in 2017. So of course they had to change the number when I left. Um, that's down in the southeast of the US. And there's not a lot in Lexington, Tennessee. It's known for being halfway between Memphis and Nashville, if you're familiar with those places. A little bit country, a little bit rock and roll. There's flat fields as far as the eye can see. Sometimes corn, sometimes soybeans. But what there aren't in Lexington, Tennessee, are a lot of mountains, which was why it was a little bit weird when I was a little girl. I would draw these pictures of mountains going into lakes, which would be really common for you guys, right? But not so much for a little girl in Tennessee. My mother didn't know what I was drawing. My grandfather had you know, just tons of them hanging around his house. But then when I finally went away for school in, in college, I ended up going to Lugano, and that was my view. And I'm, I'm telling you this not because I think I was psychic, but because I believe very strongly that the things that we think about and the visions that we paint for ourselves end up having a lot to do with our future. And this is just a kind of weird example of that. But when you think about the future that we're talking about for ourselves or that, that our movies and pop culture pre present for us, how many people know what this is? Yeah, Blade Runner, the remake. Um, it's not very, not very uh, uh, dreamy for, for the future, not very positive. And in fact, this was a picture of San Francisco in November of 2018. Uh, we had a terrible fire uh, in the area and for weeks people were wearing masks you couldn't open your um, your windows in your apartment so we are in some ways uh, becoming what we imagine and so the idea today is let's let's talk about the future that we want to build and let's think about the ingredients and what that might be and I was so excited about this conference because it is the Empowerment Foundation. I think this is such an important word, and it's one that I think about a lot in my work uh, with government and with people who are engaging with government. But right now, I think for almost anyone who works in technology, there's, or deals with technology, there's a great sense of disempowerment right now. There are so many forces that are coming at us in many ways through technology that feel like it's taking away our ability to control our lives, to make our own choices, to decide how we want our world and our societies to operate. And we're gonna hear a lot about some of these today and, and a few answers for how to address some of these things, I think. But I think, you know, sometimes we tend to be very optimistic and idealistic when we talk about technology and I think this year especially, there's a great acknowledgement that there are really big questions to address, and empowerment is gonna take some work. Uh, so, from Tennessee, Switzerland, with a few stops in between, I ended up moving to Silicon Valley in 2010 at a time when disruption was the word of the era. Uh, everything was being disrupted, and that was a very exciting thing, and you could put many, many, many pillars that have fallen on this list as individual sectors have changed and been disrupted by technology. That is not necessarily a bad thing, but what we find right now is that we have the pieces laying all over the floor. We've not yet decided what it is that we're going to take up and build from the things that have been disrupted, from the old that has been dismantled. I've used this slide so many times to describe Silicon Valley. Uh, 
But all those Lego pieces represent tremendous possibility and potential. But we have to think differently. We can't just go back and reconstruct individual silos of industries or sectors. This is a quote attributed to Bob Schaefer, who's a journalist in the US, but I think the comparison has been made many times. That the changes brought by the internet are similar to those that came with the invention of the printing press. How it improved literacy, it caused the reformation, the counter-reformation, and there were 30 years of religious wars that followed the printing press and it took about three decades for the world to reach equilibrium. Great. Uh, we're at the very beginning of what's going on now in this digital age that's taken the place of print. And so I got a little curious and I thought, okay, I wanna go back and think about this. Where exactly did Gutenberg come in and kind of the, the development of human thought? And so I you know, started pulling things out of my uh, various Wikipedia searches and plopping them into a, a timeline. And the, the technological jumps that stood out are kind of identified. And you see the, the clump there at the end, uh, uh, right, right at the end of the, the 20th and into the 21st century that Jeffrey mentioned as processing power built and ways of communicating uh, increased. And I started thinking to myself, what does this mean for the 21st century where we're, I guess, almost 20% in, we ought to have at least something figured out by now for uh, what our revolutions are going to be. <coughs> Looking at the various disruptive events that have happened in the past two decades, uh, the presidential elections in the US are just listed there for reference, not because I'm saying any are particularly disruptive, uh, but uh, we've, we've We've got interesting times, both before and ahead. We've got to think about the systems that we're going to build with those pieces of what has been disrupted. And so, as I was thinking about coming to talk about empowerment, the Empowerment Summit, I looked up the definition again and was really touched by at least one of the ones that I found, that empowerment is the process of becoming stronger and more confident, especially in controlling one's life and claiming one's rights. That is the promise that we've been talking about with technology for a decade. And that is the promise that it's time to reclaim. But we have to think deeply about it and be very conscious about it. So as was mentioned with all of the legal and policy uh, uh, pieces of my bio, I work with, with uh, policy and politics and people's interaction with it. Uh, and what we think about which is very akin to this definition of empowerment, is a sense of political efficacy. So are, do people feel that they are welcome in the political process? I know this is very interesting in Switzerland where you are for sure welcome and encouraged and required to participate. Do I know who represents me and am I able to impact the selection of that person? Am I confident in my ability to participate in, gover in governing or civic activities? And can I express political opinions freely and publicly? These are interesting metrics because we're now working to measure this as opposed to the things that many other technology companies are measuring, like clicks, eyeballs, time on site. You do things very differently if you're trying to get someone's attention as opposed to if you're trying to empower them. And what we've seen in the past decade is technology built to get your attention and hold your attention. Maybe make you mad if it requires that in order to get your attention. Maybe make you scared. So how do we think about technology and encouraging and, and, and uh, providing incentives for technology that actually builds up the kinds of muscles that have positive uh, civic and social impact? Uh, my big question is how will we balance the question of public input and data and evidence in governing uh, in, in this century? How do we ensure that the public is well informed, allow for meaningful input on policy goals and metrics, leverage data and policy modeling for development of policy options, 
measure real-time implementation and adjust and share results and get the public to weigh in again. This is, what we're talking about here is agile governing. TM, copyright. This is, this is all technically possible, but the road for getting there is going to be a long one. This is what obsesses me. So, does this look familiar to anyone? This is not the road to get there. But I put it up here because I had a wonderful conversation with an, uh, another social entrepreneur a long time ago. And we were talking about how when you go to tell someone what you're working on, you have to kind of feel them out and figure out how much can I tell you about what I'm working on? Are you gonna get the full picture? Or, are you, or do I just need to like break it down to this little piece? And he's like, it's like, Tolkien, like in order to write Lord of the Rings, he had to invent a language for the elves and draw a map and like have all of this history in order to even make the first novel make sense. And in so many ways, in thinking about the technology that we're building now, as we assemble those pieces from the silos that have been dismantled and disrupted, we can no longer just think about our own silos. We can no longer just think about a social media platform. We have to think about the impacts on democracy and, and social uh, relationships. We can no longer think about our narrow piece. And so for the, the concept of governing with data-driven metrics and balancing public participation with that, I've got a Tolkien map. And it looks a little like this. So, this is my dream of a data-driven governing structure for the 21st century, and it's got lots of pieces. I asked myself, what if you were gonna build an algorithm for automatically implementing laws? What if you were going to try to optimize with a data model for the best policy options that could meet metrics that were decided on by the people? So the idea is that you have certain principles, core uh, rights and laws that, you know, those are, the, those are your Asimov's laws. Those are the ones that cannot be violated. <laughs> and you have opportunities for public input, both at elections, but then in an ongoing way, particularly, ideally, in a somewhat more light touch way going forward. And then the lawmakers are there to take those metrics decided by the people and turn them into policy options. How would we meet these goals that are established by the people? And then through policy modeling and assessment and building on data that's available that has been magically standardized uh, in, in some way, that's gonna be a long process, op options are presented that can then be selected, implemented, refined, and re-implemented based on results. So this is, this is my Tolkien map of, of governing in the 21st century. And I offer it not because I think everybody will think it's great, but because I think that this kind of thinking is required in whatever sector you're entering. For you to think about how your work is a Tolkien map for the, the area that, that you're working on. So in this case, thinking just about the pieces, the public input side of a new governing model requires verified identity. I know that uh, several are working on that here in Switzerland. Increased civic understanding, uh, coverage of issues at all level, level of government, trusted easy opportunities for engagement and interaction, and engaging a broad and diverse population. Depending on the country, there's a long way to go in each of these pieces. And the same on the data side. It's not just a question of standardizing the data, though that's a big challenge, making the data talk to each other, providing privacy protections. But it's a question of how will you even establish the meta goals for a policy process that is assisted by machine learning? And what is a federated data structure that can be trusted and protect privacy while drawing meaningful conclusions? But there's some innovation happening here, at least on the goal side. And one of the leaders is, is New Zealand, actually. This year, New Zealand became the first country, although I, with a little asterisk, that, that Bhutan has had a gross national happiness index since 2008. But New Zealand became the first country 
uh, to design its entire budget around well-being priorities and to introduce a new index in addition to GDP for uh, measuring and assessing well-being in the policies that it carries out. So this is the beginning of an ability to measure, in addition to cost-benefit analysis of policies, what impact are those policies actually having on the population? And these are the priorities that they started with. Of course, different countries would have different priorities. But we'll see how it goes from 2019. They're, they will start measuring and quantifying uh, the well-being along these uh, parameters. And that's a pretty big idea, the idea of measuring well-being within a governing structure. But this is not, this pressure for this kind of measurement and for this kind of quantification and this kind of action is not just coming within the political sector, as I'm sure you're all aware. A recent study, uh, and this was a global study, uh, of CEOs found that large portions of, of these CEOs were feeling pressure to lead on social issues, in many cases, because governments were not. Uh, and uh, this is a global survey of individuals, 76% said that CEOs should take the lead on, on these changes in, the, in these um, areas. A recent study, uh, and this was a global study, uh, of CEOs found that large portions of, of these CEOs were feeling pressure to lead on social issues, in many cases because governments were not. Uh, and uh, this is a global survey of individuals, 76% said that CEOs should take the lead on, on these changes in, the, in these um, areas. And I think particularly interesting for today is training for the jobs of tomorrow uh, and personal data. This is a recent statement that came out in the US. I don't know if it uh, was, was uh, shared here. But the Business Roundtable is actually a very uh, influential business group within the US. And they released a statement saying that shareholder value is no longer the main objective of companies. This is, this is kind of a, an earthquake for uh, the business structure that in most cases legally requires board members and executives to maximize shareholder value at all costs. So this is, you know, it's been pilloried by some as not going far enough and praised by others as a panacea. It's not either of those, but it's an interesting step that portends some change and the need to start thinking about how we measure and implement according to different kinds of goals uh, other than just returning value to shareholders. And as we all know, there's been a surge of activism around the globe. Uh, on various issues and in most cases led by the youth. Uh, so what would it look like for a company to measure well-being? And whose well-being are we talking about anyway? If it's not just shareholders, then is it just customers? Shareholders, customers, employees? And what about the rest of humanity and the environment? So tomorrow, for those of you who will be coming to the workshop, we'll be talking a bit about what might fit into a measurement of well-being uh, for companies as companies or organizations think about how their actions, not just their products, their employment policies, their supply chain, their purchasing decisions, could potentially be quantified or assessed in basic categories. And so on that note, I will go back to Tolkien. Uh, Memory is not what the heart desires, that's only a mirror. And that's just here to say, we, yes, it's important to look back, but right now, what is important for the conversations that Jeffrey was raising is to think about where we want to go in the future, not necessarily drawing from the past. And even the smallest person can change the course of the future. So hopefully over the course of this day, we'll figure out a lot of those steps together. Thank you so much.